Thank you so much for tuning in to our Far West Texas District 6 On the Line with AgriLife program. If you need reminders about our scheduled On the Line with AgriLife programs, you can utilize our free text messaging service. You can text at O-T-L-W-A to the number 81018. We will assure you that we will not be sending you lots of text messages. However, we will send you a few scheduled reminders about the upcoming programs. At the conclusion of today's program, we wanna encourage you to take the survey. If you take the survey, you are entered in to win one of our giveaways. The giveaway for this program will be two routine soil samples. We also wanna encourage you to sign up to receive our Connecting West Texas Farmers and Ranchers newsletter. You don't have to be from West Texas to find this use information useful. You can sign up on our website when you take our survey. Hope you saved the date for our West Texas Farmers and Ranchers Convention on July 31st and August 1st in Monahans, Texas at the Ward County Event Center. Our next On the Line with AgriLife programs occur June 16th and July 21st. June, June 16th's program will cover the economic impact of COVID-19 on the cotton industry. And on July 21st, we'll be talking drought management considerations for landowners as we approach the hottest time of our year. All right, good morning everyone. My name is Matlin Sane. I am from Presidio County and today we have Jeanette Castagnon with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Jeanette is the Horticulture Extension Agent in Midland and Ector Counties. So Jeanette, I'm going to go ahead and let you kick it off. All right, can you hear me? Yes, I'm we can hoping hear. that's a yes. <laughs> And I guess I'll just say next whenever I'm ready for my next slide. But yeah, uh, thank you for that introduction, Matlin. Uh, like she said, I'm the county extension agent out here in Midland and Odessa, which is Ector. I've been working with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension since September of last year. And yeah, let's just get going. So next. Uh, so kind of the biggest thing here that uh, this slide's kind of about is I want you to please try to refrain from calling all bugs bugs. So there's actually, um, I'll go into a little bit of the classifications, but they're not all technically bugs. There are um, different orders. Um, so technically they're all insects, not bugs. Uh, next. So just to kind of help you classify a little bit more, I'm gonna go into a little bit of defining factors of different insects. So if we're all familiar with pesticide labels, um, you know when you're reading the label, it'll tell you what it controls. So sometimes maybe you're looking at one type of insect, but you think uh, you know what it is, but you actually don't. So I'm gonna give you some defining factors of some to look out for. So the first order that I'm gonna to talk to you about that's really common is gonna be the Coleoptera, and that's gonna be your beetles. Um, and so that, uh, Coleoptera is actually, actually Latin for sheath wing, and so in the picture I have right here, you can see kind of what would be considered its little sheath, um, and so that's um, when you look at a ladybug, the little um, red and black dotted part will be its sheath, and if you've ever seen a ladybug take off for flight, the little sheaths pop up, and then it shows its little membranous wings under, and a defining factor of this is that they have chewing mouth parts. So next. Uh, diptera is going to be your common house fly that you see at your house and then we all know diptera that's going to be uh, the dye which is two and so they have two wings. Next. So hemiptera uh, stands for half wing so they have a half hard wing and a half membranous wing. Um, you can kind of see on a lot of these they have what's kind of like an X on the back. Um, the stink bug kind of shows it the best. There's a bit of an X. And so you can see the uh, membranous wing at the kind of tip of its, at the, the opposite end of its head. Um, but whenever those wings open up, you can kind of see more of the half membranous wing. And these are gonna actually be your true bugs. Oh, <laughs> that's okay, next. Uh, Hymenoptera, so these are going to be your wasps, wasps and your bees and also your ants. So that stands for membranous wing. They have four wings. A lot of flies um, actually mimic this order, but if you look at the wings and you count, and if you only see two, don't get scared because sometimes it'll look like a wasp, but it's actually a fly. And uh, these have that pinched abdomen right there. This picture kind of shows it. Um, and so if you've ever seen an ant, also you've seen that pinched um, abdomen. Next. 
Lepidoptera, I pretty much just wanted to show you the pretty close-up picture of a butterfly wing, uh, but Lepidoptera stands for scale wing. And um, if you look really close here in this picture, you can actually see each individual scale on the butterfly's wing. And um, whenever you touch a butterfly, if you've ever had that kind of dust come off on your hands, that's actually its, um, that's its scales. And so you're hurting it and damaging it whenever you touch it. So try not to kind of put your fingers up on them. Next. All right, so this part's a little bit inter interactive. If anyone maybe wants to unmute for a second or put in the chat box. Um, what would you classify as a beneficial? And then of these two photos right here, which one would you want to spray to get rid of? Jeanette, yes. that pop bug looks um, a little scary, so I'm going to take a wild guess and say maybe the top one. All right, okay. So we're thinking the top one because it looks a bit gnarlier. It's not as pretty, of course. The first one, kill it. All right. <clears throat> so you're thinking the ladybug is beneficial. All right, good, good. <clears throat> oh, next, sorry. <laughs> so actually, they're the same thing. So um, that top photo is actually just the immature version of the ladybug. So whenever it's going through its awkward early stages, we've all had that. Um, but yeah, so it's actually doing a lot of good for your garden. It's going to be eating all your aphids. And if you're familiar with aphids, which I'm sure a lot of you home gardeners are, um, they're what, um, they have sucking mouth parts and they're going to pierce into the xylem and phloem tissue and they're going to be sucking it out and secreting honeydew. And then honeydew sometimes leads to having sooty mold. So you do not want them on your plants, but these little ladybugs are on the way to rescue your garden. All right, next. Um, and just a really fun, some fun <laughs> comics showing them eating the um, aphids, but the larval form can eat 200 to 300 aphids daily as it develops. So they're pretty, pretty effective at killing aphids. Next. Another common one that you're probably going to see in your garden landscape is a green lacewing. This is another pest that looks really ugly um, when it's not fully grown yet and then it forms into a beautiful uh, green lacewing, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen. Um, but they actually have these little sharp mandibles and when they um, pierce the aphid, they um, are digesting it from the inside out and then they use the mandibles to suck the digested aphid out of its body um, and they can consume over 200 aphids or other prey per week. Um, next. And so this is what it's going to grow into this really pretty green um, little fly looking thing. And then as you can see here, those um, are the egg stalks under it. And so if you see those in your garden, leave those, they're going to hatch into lace wings. Next. Assassin bug, here's another common one that a lot of people, um, there are some, there's some that are red and brown, and those are the ones that are the kissing bugs, but these green lace wings are pretty much going to be eating everything. They're beneficial because they're going to be eating what you don't want, but sometimes they'll eat what you do want. So kind of, they're good and bad guys, um, but they do have kind of sticky legs, and so sometimes you'll see these walking around your garden, and they'll have little pieces of plant material and bugs on them, and they will kind of just pick at their legs and eat off the insects that are sticking to them. Next. So this is a fun one. Um, this is a tiny little wasp and it actually parasitizes the tomato hornworm. So if you have tomatoes, you do not want this tomato hornworm on your plants. Um, but what happens is the little wasp will lay its eggs and then the eggs will parasitize and they'll eat the worm inside out. And then it'll pupate like that and they'll come out and it'll kill that horn hornworm. So if you see these parasitized hornworms, leave it there. Um, it's actually gonna benefit you in the long run. Next. And of course, I just wanted to give a little um, shout out to all our pollinators, our bumblebees, carpenter bees, butterflies, moths, honeybees, and then true flies. So actually something fun about um, the true flies, you wouldn't really think of them to be pollinators, but um, that picture I have there is actually a male mosquito. And so the female mosquitoes are the ones that take the blood meal, but the male mosquitoes primarily pollinate. So you can tell the difference by the antenna. That male mosquito right there in that picture, you can see its antenna kind of look like feathers. Next. So a little bit into pests now. So we've got some leaf miner damage, some webbing and some beetle chewing damage. So next. 
So pecan nutcase bear, PNC, kind of the hot topic right now. You should possibly be thinking about spraying if you haven't yet or checking your traps. Um, but the adult moth is going to lay an egg at the base of the nutlet. And then when that um, hatches, it's going to burrow into the nut. Um, that top left picture is a really good um, indicator that you do have pecan nutcase bear. Uh, kind of the way I like to think about it is if the nutlet has coffee grounds on it, but it's not coffee grounds, it's actually the larval frass, which is a very fancy way of saying insect poop. Um, so it's gonna plug the little hole up. And so if you kind of take that um, poop plug off, you'll see a small little incision. And sometimes you can cut into the nutlet and you can see the little larva in there. So. We really want to prevent that in our landscape. Next. Aphids are another one that I kind of brought up earlier. They're in the true bug family and they have piercing sucking mouth parts. They're going to be sucking on the phloem and just completely secreting out honeydew. Um, black aphids is um, the damage in that top picture. So the black aphid doesn't just kind of tap into it. It also releases an enzyme that digests the plant tissue. So it's going to cause a lot more long-term damage as opposed to a yellow aphid, which is going to just um, be secreting, secreting honeydew, which still is annoying with all the honeydew making everything sticky. Next. Leafhoppers are going to be transmitting a lot of diseases and they um, also were going to call, cause white to yellow stippling, fleckling on top of leaves. Um, and they're going to be, they also have piercing sucking mouth parts like the aphid before. So next. Spider mites are going to be really common in uh, the greenhouse. I have had a couple of my master gardener trainees bring me in samples of this. Um, you're going to pretty much just see kind of browning on your leaves and you'll obviously see all the webbing. And when you kind of put it under a microscope or a hand lens, you're going to see the little spider mites jumping around everywhere. Um, and I kind of just recommend that you try to quarantine off anything that um, gets the spider mites and then anything else, try to wash it really well to prevent them from spreading everywhere. Next. Uh, thrips are going to be another one that are going to be um, transmitting a lot of diseases. Um, they're going to cause stippling or silvering on affected areas. And then sometimes they, you think it's spider mite, but it's um, there's going to be more tiny dark spots of fecal deposits that are going to let you know that you have thrips. Next. Scale is more of a um, cosmetic issue. Um, they do kind of secrete some honeydew, but I've never really felt like, unless you have a really dense population of it, but if you do see it, kind of just pick it off. Um, these are harder to kill because they have that hard shell on them. So any pesticide that you spray on them is not gonna get through that little shell. So you're gonna have to kind of be um, applying something a lot more um, systemic. Next. And then we have nematodes. Um, these are going to be causing a lot of uh, stunting issues. This is more common in uh, sandy soils. So just try to kind of remediate your soil to try to prevent any sandy conditions because they really like that. Um, the nematode is going to feed on the root tissue. And then when it feeds on the root tissue, it causes galls to form. And then when the galls form, then the root can't effectively take up any water anymore. Um, and so we really want to try to get those out of our soil. And if you already know it's in your soil, you can sometimes plant marigolds and those will help kind of make the soil not a happy place for them. Next. And then here are some insecticides that you can kind of, um, active ingredients that are really good. Um, imidacloprid is a really common one. Halophenoside, carbaryl, trichlorophen, bifenthrin, I get so tongue-tied, sorry. Um, cyfluthrin, and then fipronil. Um, and then I also have the common names on the side, which are a lot easier to pronounce, um, but we wanna go by active ingredient. Um, and that's kind of just what I've got for you, a real quick presentation there. Uh, do we have any questions? Please remember that you can uh, utilize the chat box if you have a question. Yeah, I have the chat box open. 
Jeanette also I sent you that email with those pictures of those the pests that need to be identified. Yes. Um, so I'm pretty sure that first one is an army worm. Um, and so you can use Carbaryl or VT on that. Um, I guess I could email you this too, so she can have a better um, answer. And then um, the second one, which was a green spider, I'm pretty sure is a beneficial green lynx spider. So just let it live its life. It's there to help you. Which you do you use for brown curling leaves on ornamental pear tree? Um, it depends. It's so hard with brown curling leaves. Uh, Terry Corwin asked, what should you use for brown curling leaves on ornamental pear tree? Um, sorry, I'm getting a private message too. Um, it depends if it kind of what the cause of the brown curling leaves could be. If it's insect damage, if it's water, um, if you could send me some pictures over that could maybe help me narrow that down. Oh, to use on the army worm, um, you can use carbaryl or BT. BT is Bacillus thuringiensis. Um, I have a list of things. I guess I can put it in the chat box. I think everyone can see that. Jeanette, whenever you have a second, I do have some more questions that just came in. Uh, sure. Let me know when you're ready. Um, I, I think I'm ready. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so someone asked, what is a good organic option for spraying those pests and, and insects? Yeah, um, so always what I kind of, I have a master gardener, she's really, um, really conscious about all of that. I always try to, so kind of the easiest one, which is kind of silly, but just kind of spray it with water. Um, that kind of will knock everything off. And then safer soap will be the next option that I'll go to because it's still a little bit um, gentle. So you can actually buy the actual safer soap, or if you look up the uh, recipe for it, it's usually just like a couple parts Dawn dish soap and some water. And that'll kind of help break down the, um, the tissue on the insect. And then neem oil is a little bit stronger and is also another good option. Okay, perfect. Um, so another question I have here is, will spraying for bad moths also kill the pretty butterflies? Yeah, so that kind of goes back to knowing your label, knowing what uh, you're spraying for. And so some of those caterpillars, of course, are going to grow into butterflies. Um, and so when I was talking about the orders earlier and I said Lepidoptera, a Lepidoptera is going to be a butterfly and a moth. It doesn't discriminate. Um, so you kind of got to be careful what you're spraying and where you're spraying it. Um, so say you have a lot of um, your butterflies on one um, shrub in your garden and you go out and spray for um, the caterpillars, careful where it drifts, careful, read the label um, for what um, it's going to be targeting. 
Okay, perfect. Um, last question here that I received. Uh, so someone, they want to attract more butterflies in their garden. Can you recommend anything for that? Yeah, so butterflies are really interesting. They taste with their feet. Uh, so when they land on the flowers and the leaves, um, they're gonna know if when they they can they're gonna know if their larva can feed on that. Um, so just kind of look up what um, the butter the larval form likes to eat, and the butterfly will be attracted when it tastes it with its feet. <laughs> this sounds really weird, but um, of course we all know milkweed is gonna be attracting monarchs because that's what their larva like to eat. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Do we have any more questions for Jeanette? Alrighty, so um, before we end this program, I want to quickly talk about um, an upcoming program. So um, this is for Presidio County. However, anyone is more than welcome to join. Um, it's called Backyard Basics with an emphasis on gardening. Uh, this program is on Friday, May 29th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. It is a virtual free program and we'll be having speakers Jeanette Castagnon again, along with David Apple and Jonathan Motzinger. Um, more information can be found at the District 6 Facebook page, and that is the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service Far West Texas District 6 Facebook page, or by going to presidio.agrilife.org. Cody? Yeah. Just want to thank everybody so much for tuning in today with On the Line with AgriLife. Um, don't forget our next programs are June 16th, and we'll be discussing the economic impact of COVID-19 on the cotton industry. And then on July 21st, uh, we'll be discussing drought management considerations from landowner. Um, we really encourage you to go to our website and take the survey to be entered to win the two free routine soil samples. Uh, the survey link will be active until next month's program, and then we'll draw for the voucher uh, for the soil samples next month during our program. If you have any questions, please let us know, uh, and we look forward to seeing you on June 16th. Everyone have a wonderful day.